<clears throat> Good to be back with you. Uh, wonderful seeing some familiar faces that I, my wife and I are, my wife is right there, aka the lovely creature. My wife and I are still, uh, you know, have wonderful ties here. We were here for about a year and a half before we moved out. Have I said my name yet? <laughs> my name's Bill Warner, and so that's okay. Um, so we live about 45 minutes west, and we're part of the Indian Creek campus in uh, Shabanaugh. My wife and I jokingly, somewhat seriously, kid that uh, where we live, uh, I affectionately refer to it as Eastern Iowa. So if that gives you any indication, we love it out there. Um, thankful to be part of the Indian Creek campus, but also thankful to, to be here with you and see some, uh, some wonderful friends. It's a Friends are a blessing, yes? What a, what a privilege to have. Hi, Mrs. Hayes. What a pri- <laughs> So many faces. Okay, um, that reminds me. Yeah, you're, uh, un- you're in this sermon. Yeah, but not by name. <laughs> well, you weren't going to be in by name, but too late. Um, this is off-center. Is that okay? It's not like... Like, if I was sitting out there, I'm like, why isn't, why isn't this, like, in the center, right? But this is how it was, so I'm not touching anything, so <laughs> just gonna, we're gonna go with it, okay? Um, I am, even though we're on the west side, I am an east sider by heart. Uh, from a, yeah. <laughs> Two of us. But well, there's more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're coming out. Okay, we are overcomers, man. Um, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. Uh, great music. Wow. About two weeks after I became a Christian, I asked God. So I came to Christ, became part of the family of God at the age of 23, five years ago. And uh, I prayed this prayer. Lord, don't ever let me forget what it was like living life without you. And like the feelings, the emotions, everything attached to it. And God has been faithful. And when we sing music like that, and when it's just well, people who are gifted musically lead us along. Man, that just, that gets in you, yes? Like it messes with you in a good way so I'm an east sider at heart and uh, born and raised on the east side and um, still today this is this is a claim to fame but it's kind of shameful for East Aurora High School graduate east high class of and so (laughs) no I don't have a problem with the age thing class of 77 1977 and uh, played baseball And in my humble opinion, baseball is like the best sport ever. Now, I don't know where you guys are at with sports and things like that, but I'm just telling you, it's almost biblical, that baseball is the, and there's not a close second, just saying. So uh, I was on the baseball team, and our junior year, we did something that prior to that, East Aurora had, and this is where the shame part comes in, East Aurora had never accomplished before. We won the Upstate 8 Conference. And uh, um, junior year. So senior year, baseball season, several on the team were thinking we're all that. Like, we won conference, man. We didn't beat West High in the regional championship, though, but wait, there's more. Uh, And so... A fair amount on the team didn't have the best work ethic going into the season. And it showed. Like, we were playing 500 ball. And uh, I'll never forget, it was a Saturday. It was a doubleheader against, of all teams, Aurora Central. And we should have waxed them, man. We should have had two five-inning games. That's what it should have. We won one, lost one. Like, what is going... Ooh, I'll never forget what happened afterwards. So uh, we get in the locker room, and Coach Bolin said, sit down. Like, ooh, my attention to get her. We didn't go to our lockers, nothing, still everything. And we sat down on the bench. 
And he proceeded to let us have it. And rightly so. Rightly so. Now, never forget, in his tirade, uh, we had these posts strategically located in the, uh, in, the, in the locker room, heavy metal posts. And he had, a, he had like a press board clipboard with the lineups and everything on it. Never forget, he took that and smashed it against one of the posts, and it just shattered like a bazillion pieces. From that point on, we were a different team. We actually went on to win conference again, and that year, we also beat West High in the regional champion. Can I get an amen for that? Yeah, yeah. Even if you're like, you're from the West Side, that's, yeah, that's pretty. And I got the game-winning hit. So if that matters to anybody, if you're going to listen closer to the sermon because of that. But here was Coach Boland's point. We hadn't shown up. We were playing baseball, but we were not showing up. This passage today is all about, in the Christian life, it's all about showing up. And you know, you know what I mean by showing It's one thing to go, this is not about going through the motions. This is real. This is real life. This is about showing up to the game of life as a citizen of the kingdom, as a child of God. It's about, <clears throat> if it's about anything, it's about showing up. So if you're, if you're there already or you've opened up to it somehow, some way, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, winding down this wonderful series in the book of Ephesians. Um, the book of Ephesians is a wonderful book to, get a, to, to, to help you get established in the faith. Wonderful book. <clears throat> and, and hopefully that, that has come out and hopefully uh, you've leaned into that as this series has gone along. So I'm going to walk through verses 10 through 17. I'm going to start at verse 10. And an interesting word there uh, at the very beginning, finally. So Paul's wrapping things up, man. He's winding it down. And he is going to dip back into uh, previous aspects of his letter when he talks about the armor of God. Uh, these, these six pieces of armor aren't anything he hasn't talked about already earlier in, uh, in, uh, in the book, in his letter, and we'll, we'll get to that. Finally, so this is, he's, this, is, this is, a he's beginning his conclusion. So he's tying things together. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. I'll be um, teaching, preaching from the CSB, Christian Standard, Standard Bible. Be strengthened, so, so note that. Be strengthened, it's command. Like, get after it, show up. Be strengthened by the Lord and in his... Here's what Paul is saying. You are receiving, you have received this strength from the Lord. But you must, key word here, appropriate, access and use. But you must appropriate it. You must access it and use it. Be strengthened by the Lord, by his vast strength. This is... He's saying, Ephesians, and by extension to us, it's time to get after it. It is time to stop playing games in the Christian life. It is time to show up. Verses 11, 12, and 13 I'm going to read it, and then I want to look at some, some key words here before we actually get into the armor. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces, key phrase here, in the heavens. Verse 13, for this reason, 
Take up the full armor of God so that, why, Paul, why? So that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Let's look at some key words here that, that Paul is heading our way. Full armor. It refers to the offensive-defensive equipment that, an, that, a, that a Roman infantryman would have customarily worn. You can check out, check out this, uh, this picture on the screen. These soldiers, when working together, were essentially an invincible force. Each guy had the other guy's back. Now, in the grand scheme of things in the world, in America, we, we, are, we are, generally speaking, we are in the, what's termed the western part of the world. So let me help you understand something. In the western part of the world, we tend to value individualism rugged individual kind of mentality. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we, there shouldn't be personal responsibility. Of course there should. But we tend to go in this direction. Many other parts of the world tend to go highly communal. So if we spend too much time over there, we neglect community. If we spend too much time over here, we forget we are individuals. The happy medium is the biblical. But we in the West... We'll read a passage like this and think it's all about us individually. No, it's a both and. It's about me and you. It's about we. Check out how this, this would, the, the Ephesians got this. They would have understood totally what Paul was after here. This shoulder to the shoulder kind of stuff. Each soldier doing their part. full armor stand three times 11, 12, 13, 14 verse 14 is the third time Three. you hear a, hermeneutics 101 you hear a word repeated, you see a word repeated that's probably the author trying to get your attention trying to emphasize something this word stand the picture here is not of a march it's not of an assault what's going on here is it's a picture of holding one's position against an enemy's attack. It is, in effect, showing up and standing your ground. Sometimes that may mean individually. Often that means corporately. But everybody doing their part, showing up and standing their ground. One of the best examples that I can think of to illustrate this. Any uh, Lord of the Rings fans? All right, all right. So this comes from the book and then the movie, uh, the first in the trilogy, uh, Fellowship of the Ring, okay? So they're, I'm not gonna get into, I, it's so, it's such a good, you should read it and watch it. Fellowship of the Ring. The scene you're about to see is where Gandalf the Grey is taking a stand. He's showing up against the, uh, the uh, uh, evil uh, demon Balrog. And there's this classic, classic line, and you'll, you'll hear it if you listen carefully, where he takes his staff and he pounds it, almost plants it on this bridge as the evil demon Balrog is, cha is chasing uh, Gandalf the Grey and his, and his fellowship. And he says, he, plant, he says, you shall not pass. If I could sum up succinctly what this passage is all about for a Christian, it's that. We are saying because of our in Christness, we are standing our ground shoulder to shoulder and we are saying to the enemy, you shall not pass. Watch the clip. Over the bridge! Fire!
I am certain to the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Arnor. The dark fire will not avail you, flame of Uldun! Go back to the shadow! Classic light versus darkness, good versus evil scene motif. Yes, who who's seen who's seen you? Oh. <laughs> and we're like, uh, let it keep playing, right? Oh my word! That's what you need to picture. We are saying to the darkness. Not on our own, but because we're in Christ. We, he, he's overcome, right? We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You, last Saturday, last Saturday, uh, there's a group of us, a few, few members from, from this church. We went over, spent a couple hours inside East Aurora High School. A dear friend of mine works there, and uh, he's been sharing with us about what's happening, and so we decided this is like spiritual battle stuff. So we went over there, and we spent two hours at strategic places that, that he was aware of. You know what we did? In effect, you know what we did? We told the evil one at these various places, we planted and we said, you shall not pass. You can't have these kids. You cannot have this staff. You shall not pass. There's a very real battle going on, child of God. Very real battle going on. I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Ugh. This, whole, this whole idea of showing up, you shall not pass, what it is is leaning into, tapping into, living in our in Christness. Paul talks about it. So go back to chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, watch this, with every spiritual blessing. The armor of God is part of the spiritual blessing that we have been blessed with by the Father through the Son because we are in Christ. Spiritual blessings, where, where, where? In the heavens, in Christ. That's an important phrase for Paul in this book. In the heavens, in Christ. We're gonna come back to that phrase. Now this word in verse 11, schemes, literally, the word means methods. It's the same word used in chapter 4 and verse 14, translated techniques of deceit. Techniques of deceit. The armor of God is Paul's way of revealing to us some of the plans, some of the methods, some of the schemes, some of the techniques of deceit that the evil one uses. If you want to know how he can work, there's six elements right here that we're going to walk through. All have to do with techniques of deceit. Struggle, verse 12. I feel it. Do you feel it? The word means to wrestle, to grapple with as in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I, f I feel the battle, man. It gets really, really hot sometimes, yes? It's real. The heavens, verse 12, in Greek thought it meant 
the place of the gods, same word used several times previous, and Jesus actually uses it in Matthew 18, verse 35, when he talks about heavenly father. Paul's painting a picture here. There's, there's more to the reality than what, the, than what meets the eye, right? There's both the seen reality, the physical world, there's, both the, there's also the unseen reality, the immaterial world or the immaterial reality. And who dwells there? God, Satan, bad angels, good angels, host of other things, right? My experience, as limited as it is with Christians, when it comes to the unseen reality, we tend to go to one of two extremes, ignore, obsess. Neither one is healthy. Last I checked, this is not a book about Satan. Satan's one of the characters in it. But this is a book about who primarily? Jesus Christ, right? This is God revealing himself in written word to us. His plans, his purposes, and his ways. And oh, by the way, Satan's a player. But don't ignore him. But don't obsess over him. Um... Last I checked, Jesus walked out of the tomb, yes? When that happened, Satan's days were numbered. He is a defeated foe. Now, there are still battles going on, for sure. And we don't want to be ignorant of those. But uh, I've, I've read the book of Revelation a few times, and uh, spoiler alert, God wins, okay? We have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and power of our testimony. Good stuff, good stuff. Okay, in the heavens, all right. Now, I want to do a little, this is the teacher in me. This is like the hermeneutics teacher in me, but it's so important to what Paul is doing. Um, uh, verses 11 and 13, book end, verse 12. So if we could pop that slide up on the screen. The armor of God is essentially the how that answers the what. So, so this is, this is diagrammatically what Paul is trying to do by mirroring. So A, A1, B, B1 is Paul mirroring, okay? But what he's getting at is verse 12. That's what he's emphasizing. That's what he wants to bring our attention to. So look at A, put on the full armor of God so you can stand. A1, for this reason, take up the full armor of God. Why? So you so take your stand, okay? So it's mirroring. Look at B and B1, against the schemes of the devil, able to resist an evil day. All of that is to draw our attention to Paul's focus. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces. Where, 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 Paul? In the heavens. You need spiritual weapons to fight spiritual battles in the heavenlies. That's the focus. That, that right there is the reason for the armor of God. So I wanted to show you that diagrammatically so you could see what Paul is doing because we read it on a page, what's going on, all that. Everybody good with that? Okay, no charge with that. It came with your tuition. Um, okay, I'm gonna get real here. Are you ready? Open up your heart a little bit. Have you ever at least entertained the possibility that the hot button social political issues of our day, have you ever entertained the possibility that maybe, just maybe, beneath them, in the unseen reality, might just be these spiritual cosmic dark forces driving them I'm not saying totally because humans are complicit in it but is it at least possible even plausible that that stuff is going on behind the scenes I think it is I really do now here's where it gets real 
We have to do better, Christians. We have to do better here. Because if we're not careful, and I've just, ugh, if we're not careful, here's what we will do in these cultural issues, right? I mean, who would think that, man, I wish I had one. Should have brought one. Who would think that this little thing covering our face would divide us? Who, who would think, right? This thing masks COVID that, that brings such division. I wonder sometimes, and I'm not talking about the world, I'm talking about the church. I wonder sometimes if we would rather demonize people than demonize demons. You let that sit. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Those people on the other side of whatever the issue is, do you understand they are fellow image bearers? I'm not saying we have to agree. With, I don't even agree with everything I do. It's not reasonable. I'm going to agree with... Babe, in our nearly 40 years of marriage, have we ever argued? No. We've never argued. But we've had... Many, many, too many to count, many instances of intense fellowship. <laughs> we, yeah, so, right? W disagree, but disagree well. Stand your ground if necessary, for sure. And child of God, you're gonna have to figure out, you really are, especially in our culture. What is worth standing your ground for and saying this far and no farther versus no, that's not a hill I'm going to die on. Takes a lot of wisdom. Takes a lot of discernment. Child of God, let's stop demonizing people and let's demonize demons. I mean, think of the phrasing that we use, demonize people. What? That doesn't even make sense. There's a whole range of spiritual forces, spiritual darkness, various capabilities that we... So let me um, pop something on the screen for you. Just, I just want you to take some time and check it out. Biblically, these are some of the names that the Bible has given us to describe Satan. You get the picture, yes? You have to get this. Satan hates your guts. And he's not playing. He's the best at what he does. He's a liar. He's the father of lies, and he is really, really, really good at it. But don't fear him. Because you are in Christ, you actually have authority over him. Never told to fear him. We are told, we're encouraged not to ignore him, not to obsess over him. All right. This passage is not meant to foster an attitude of fear, but rather a spirit of confidence and hope with the sense that Satan, like, technically is defeated and one day will be ultimately defeated. Our struggle is against spiritual forces, against ideas. We're part of this, think about it. How incredible is this? We're part of this cosmic battle waged in another realm of reality. If you've ever read the book of Job, you get some insight into this. All right, before we walk into the armor of God, let me just put this statement in place. The armor is God's. The responsibility to put it on is ours. The armor is God's. The responsibility to wear it or appropriate it, access it and use it, is mine and it's yours. These are part of our spiritual blessings in Christ. All right, you ready to get in the armor of God? 
Yep. Okay. All right, let's go to verse, uh, we'll start at verse 14. Just going to walk through these six pieces of armor and make a few comments. Belt of truth, first part of 14. The belt of truth held other parts of the armor together, held the sword. Now I'm going to go back to a, to a passage, go back a couple chapters to chapter 4, where Paul brings this to bear, where he starts talking about this idea of truth. Chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the, and here's that, here's that phrase, techniques of deceit, but speaking the truth in love. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow, grow up in every way into him who is, who is the head, and that's Jesus, that's Christ. Uh, in 2016, the Oxford Dictionaries, like, I don't know how they come up with this stuff, but they said, this is our word of the year. You know what the word was? It's a hyphenated word, so it's kind of tricky. Post-truth. Post-truth. Relating to circumstances in which people respond more to feelings, nothing more than to feelings and beliefs rather than facts. I see this in my classroom. I teach juniors and seniors at Aurora. I see this in the classroom. And it sounds like this. And maybe you use this phrasing. I'm not judging much. Um, it sounds like this. I'll, we'll, we'll be in discussion. I'll ask a student a question. And they will begin. Uh, Mr. Warner, I feel like. and I, So, when you say you feel like, do you mean you've come to the informed conviction that? Or do you mean subjectively you just feel like? Like, which is it? Do you see how this kind of subjectivity has crept into our lingo? I feel like post-truth. Um, in this area of post-truth politics, it's easy, too easy for Christians to cherry-pick data and reach any conclusion you like. As long as it fits your tribe's narrative. Hmm. That's crap. That's bogus. That should not be said of followers of Christ. We are kingdom. Our primary tribe, saints of God, children of God, family of God. We have many tribes we're part of, right? But our first, our first allegiance is kingdom citizens. And everything trickles down from there. That ought to inform everything else. I'm not saying God is anti-uniqueness. Anti I'm not saying that at all. I mean, check out Revelation. Gather around the throne. Every tribe, tongue, nation, language, all that kind of good. God loves diversity, right? Not saying that at all. We Are you living in your echo chamber? There are people in your sphere of influence who don't know Christ. And they need to hear and see the truth in love lived out. You are a kingdom citizen, first and foremost. Anybody familiar with the uh, uh, website, the Babylon Bee, the organization Babylon Bee? Uh, satirical Christian uh, site. Their, their, their slogan, their catchphrase is, fake news you can trust. We got to do better, people. Too much at stake. Too much at stake. Truth, belt of truth. Breastplate of righteousness, second part of verse 14. Cover the soldier, neck to waist, front, back, protecting vital organs. See this as a practical living out of who we are in Christ. This in Christness stuff. Over 15 times in that short, short book of Ephesians, Paul uses that phrase. You think he's trying to get our attention with something? The in so we live out our day-to-day -day life from a posture of our in Christness. Here's part of what that means as it relates to righteousness. When the Heavenly Father, if you're in Christ, when the Heavenly Father looks at you, he sees you as he would see his son, holy 
and blameless. In other words, righteous. Now, Paul says, live that out. Live from the truth, from the reality of that posture. When you, when you begin to buy into that, like you can, you can take off the masks. Yes, masks, plural. When we come to buy into the reality that who we are in Christ, that my Father loves me, period. No qualifiers. He loves me on my good days and on my bad. No qualifiers. I am loved, period. The one who loves me best knows me best. And when you get that, you can, you are free, right? You don't have to play the tribalism game. You don't have to play the us versus them thing. Why? Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Almost went to preaching there. Chapter 1, verse 4, for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be what? To be what? To be holy and blameless in love before him. You're standing in a very, very real way before God your Father is holy, blameless, righteous, done. When Jesus walked out of the tomb, done. Now live from that reality. Child of God, live from that reality. Sandaled feet of the gospel of peace, verse 15. Kind of a unique feature of Roman sandals was they had these, these metal spikes on the bottom which helped them stand, quite literally, helped them have a better grip in often these, these muddy, treacherous conditions that they were doing battle in. Go back to chapter 2, verse 17. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away, Gentiles, and, to pe and peace to those who were near, Jews. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, so then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Not only is the gospel of peace for us, it's also for others in our sphere of influence. We take it. You take God wherever you go. As a Christian, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ dwells within us. We take him wherever we go. No matter where you go, there you are. No matter where you go, there he is. That, that ought to both encourage us and sober us. I'm going to try and tie in the, the, the gospel of peace with the helmet of salvation. There's a connection there. Shield of faith. Made of wood covered with leather, leather that could be soaked in water to help extinguish the flaming arrows of the enemy. Calls, Paul says the fiery darts. That's what he was alluding to. Chapter 3, verse 16. Check it out. I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts. How, how, how? Paul, through faith. I pray that you being rooted and established yeah, that you may be able to know. Paul tries to describe the indescribable. How high, why, low. This is the love of God. Rest in it. It's yours. Through Christ and in Christ. The helmet of salvation. Verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In him, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth. What is the word of truth in this context, Paul? He tells us, the gospel of your salvation. And when you believed, the Holy Spirit is down payment, our inheritance of the redemption and uh, uh, possession of the praise of his glory. Listen well. The gospel, Paul talks about this at length in the book of Romans. The gospel is not just for salvation. It is also for sanctification. Sanctification, our becoming more and more and more and more like Christ. In other words, we as Christians need to revisit the reality of the gospel in our life every single day. It's applicable every single day. It is not just for our salvation. It is also for our sanctification. Put it on, strap it on every day. The helmet of salvation. 
You missed a great spot for an amen there. I mean, if you, it feels forced that way, doesn't it? Finally, last piece of armor, sword of the spirit, which is the what? The what? The word of God. Roman soldiers carried what was considered the primo, like the premier weapon of the day. It was this rather short double-edged sword, super useful in hand-to-hand -hand combat. In fact, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 12, uh, talks about that, alludes to that. For the word of God is sharper than any, any there it is. Yeah, he's totally going, going back to that. Chapter 5, uh, verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Okay, cool. Um, but this is what I want to get to. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to do what? To make her holy. How? How did Jesus do that? By the washing of the water of the word. If you want to know what it looks like someone who is consumed with the word of God here's my encouragement to you slowly, carefully methodically walk through Psalm 119 you want to get a taste for what it how is oh gosh stepping on toes how's your scripture mem memorization going these days just, just. Memorization leads to meditation, leads to saturation. Let me say that again. Memorization leads to meditation, leads to saturation. You want to know what it looks like to be saturated by the Word of God? Then get into Psalm 119. That dude or dudette was on it with the Word of God. Holy cow. All right. You guys all right? We doing all right? We hanging in there? Have you checked out? Okay, in closing. Finally, almost 100 years ago, in West Texas, very famous oil field, it's called the Yates Pool. A man by name of Yates owned it. And when he... When he purchased the property, he also purchased the oil and mineral rights that were contained beneath the, the property. All, all, all came in one package. Well, this thing called the Great Depression hit, and like many, many, many people, um, he fell behind in his, in his mortgage payment, couldn't pay the principal, couldn't pay the interest, kept falling farther and farther behind. Um, uh, he, would, he would graze his sheep. He was a, a, a sheep, sheep herder. Uh, and you know how much longer how much longer can I hang on how much longer can I hang on it was on government subsidy one day a seismographic crew from an oil company was in the area they knocked on his door and began to talk to him and said you know what it's we think you think there could be oil on your land, under your land. Would you let us drill a well and check it out? So Mr. Yates signed a lease agreement with the oil company. And they drilled. And at a little over 1,000... This is, this is mind-boggling. At a little over 1,000 feet, they struck a massive oil reserve to the tune of 80,000 barrels a day. Now, if you were to go to the stock exchange and see what uh, barrels of oil are going, that comes out in, at today's exchange rate, $6 million a day. They drilled subsequent wells that yielded twice that much. In fact, 30 years after, after, later, after the initial discovery, in the 1960s, they, they found a, an oil reserve that was capable of producing 125,000 barrels of oil. 
a day. And Mr. Yates owned it all. But here he was, right? A multi, multi, multi millionaire living in poverty. What was the problem? What was the snag? He owned it, right? But he didn't possess it. Dear child of God, because of your in Christness, you own, man, all of the spiritual blessings in Christ, which includes the armor of God. That's not the question. You own it. The question is, do you possess it? There's a radical difference between owning and possessing.